Um, today, we're going to be talking about why I believe the first step to an accessibility first engineering culture is not an accessibility team, but an accessibility mindset about why your organization will benefit more from a network of inexperienced advocates than a centralized yet siloed group of experts. Before we start, though, I should make it clear that there is no hard and fast way, no correct way to go about any of what we'll be looking at. <clears throat> this is not a science, and I am very much no expert. So some of what follows may work for you, and some of it almost certainly won't. You will need to find the fixes <clears throat> that best suit your organization, your colleagues, and yourself. So let's begin then with a couple of short stories. Almost everything you're about to hear in these stories is fictional. Any resemblance to actual events or people living or dead is entirely coincidental, no matter how familiar they may seem. But the problems are, for the most part, very real indeed. So imagine, if you will, that you've recently started in a new role working for an online marketplace. They sell things like crocheted kitten tea cozies, bedazzled petroleum jelly, and wooden spoons emblazoned with Nicolas Cage's face. What's more, your colleagues seem great. There's free lunch, and the dental plan is amazing. You're kind of hoping things are going to be pretty good from an accessibility perspective, too. They sell stuff, right? Emphasis definitely on the stuff here. We're talking real financial transactions with real customers, and there are laws preventing businesses from discriminating against customers on the basis of a disability. So it's probably all good, right? Unfortunately, because we're talking fiction here, it's not long before you realize all is not good. Navigation of the website is inconsistent, making it hard for people with low vision or memory and cognitive issues. The screen reader experience is terrible, frankly. Color contrast is all over the place. You start to think to yourself, what can I do about this? You can't just walk out. You've only been there a few weeks. And anyway, you really need the healthcare benefits. So after a couple of months settling in, you decide you're going to sign up to do a lunchtime talk. One of those, here's something fun to talk about, chats, where everyone brings a kale and quinoa salad and their homebrew kombucha. Now you just have to work out how to get people to come and listen. A few weeks later, the big day arrives. You do your best to communicate the issues without just saying, this is terrible. How did it get this bad? And apparently, people don't like it very much when you point out their implicit biases. You talk about what the site looks like and what the site sounds like, about how confusing large parts of it are, both visually and cognitively. And people love it. They really take what you're saying to heart. You're talking talk is so successful that someone who's been around quite a while approaches you after and asks, how did it get this bad? This is terrible. So you spend the rest of the afternoon talking through the issues. They promise to go away and talk to some managers, get some conversations going. I know, it's still fictional. Before you know it, an accessibility team has been created. It's small, but keen to take on the task. They start strong and get stuck in the core experience improves and things are looking up. However, here be dragons. All the other teams are still going about their business. The accessibility team cannot be in every meeting or involved in every conversation. For every problem they solve, five more are created by other teams still not thinking about accessibility. They become a firefighting squad working in a building filled with casual pyromaniacs. It doesn't take long for them to burn out. Not ideal. The end. So let's try another story. Perhaps it'll have a happier ending. This time, let's imagine you're working at a social media company. We'll keep it simple and say they operate mostly with text. No big multimedia issues to worry about. You try to make accessibility a part of everything you do. You make sure you're outspoken about the importance of accessible design. It isn't long before you find other people with similar mindsets. 
designers, developers, some project managers, you decide to meet up and talk about accessibility. At this meeting, you devise a plan to create an informal network of like-minded people throughout the company who can drive conversations within each of their teams. By talking about accessibility at the start, you'll reduce the problems at the end, or at least that's the idea. You agree to meet regularly, to share ideas, to review requirements documentation. The group slowly grows and you all learn from each other. You all start to develop a better understanding of the many aspects of accessibility in the technology field. People outside of your group pick up on your activities too, proactively sending you ideas and documents to look at. So far, so good. One day, in a far off corner of the company, an idea is born. What if, instead of just typing, we let people talk? It's a golden idea. It goes all the way to the top. They love it. The team is given the go ahead to build the product. It's kept under wraps with a direct line to the top table. Nobody in the accessibility network is aware. Again, this is entirely fictional. Things never play out this way in the real world. Launch day arrives, designs are done, features are complete, the product drops, the fanfare commences. People love the new feature. Well, mostly. Until someone points out that they can't hear the content. They're in the library and they don't have headphones. They want to participate, but they can't. Other people agree. They're at work. They were the baby. They're on the bus. They're all in situations where they can't listen and there's no alternative access available. This audio feature was released without captioning. Now, of course, those people will find that their context shift and they'll be able to make use of the feature eventually. The people with hearing loss don't get that benefit. They will forever be excluded. Without captioning, there is no way for them to ever take part in the conversation. The media jump on the story. Public condemnation ensues. This totally fictitious social media company is resoundingly condemned for releasing an inaccessible product. Again, not ideal. The end. So what can we take away from these two stories? In the first story, the accessibility team completely burns out because they're siloed, isolated and overwhelmed. They don't, indeed can't, play active part in general development of the company because they're a small team and there's just too much happening. Instead of being involved in product conversations and design reviews at the start of the process, they're left to rectify problems already created. Moreover, without the rest of the company also thinking about accessibility and building accessibility in from the start, the team cannot keep pace with the number of issues that arise. So there needs to be a culture built in throughout an organization, thinking about accessibility right from the ground level. In the second story, we see that we see that culture being developed. We see people spread across the organization, thinking about accessibility and trying to make systemic changes to reduce the number of problems that an accessibility team might be faced with. However, this network of accessibility-minded people were effectively a guerrilla group. They did not have a formal remit to be involved. While they had the support of their immediate colleagues, they did not have the support of the processes around them. What we see happen then is a product go live that is really inaccessible and a PR disaster. Without an explicit requirement to have product ideas reviewed and decisions signed off, there is no formal process. And without that formal process, things are easily missed. Proposals and designs might not get submitted to the accessibility network. Proposals and designs might not get reviewed or reviewed in a timely manner when they are submitted. Reviewer feedback might not be adhered to when it's given. Now, neither of these stories are without their positive points, of course. In the first story, a formal team was created with an active remit. They were given time, albeit not nearly enough, to work on accessibility features, to review documents, to have conversations. The second story showed 
that with people in the right places at the right times, a lot of problems can be discovered early and removed before they balloon out of control. For the two completely fictional companies in our story, both multinational corporations, I'd imagine, an ideal setup would be both an accessibility team and a supporting network through the company, all formalized and with remits from upper management. Clearly, it's not that simple though. So let's look quickly at how we can go about getting leadership support. The first thing I would say is to ask yourself, do we need leadership support? Ideally, they would come in and ask you to get it set up, but in practice, that rarely happens. If you start small, start with the people you know and get things moving, you have evidence that you can take to leadership to show how it's working. But that is often not that easy either. Uh, from my own experience, I secured leadership buy-in by accidentally embarrassing my employer on the public stage. Though effective, I do not really advise this approach. It would be far more sensible to formalize a plan where you can show how catching issues early will prevent much more work in the long run. It prevents engineer time, it prevents design time, it prevents publicity problems. Ultimately though, and this is a hard one to argue, I grant you, we need to think about how and why and who we're developing for. We would not decide to put out a feature that excluded women or that excluded Asians or excluded some other part of society that we accept we want as customers. We need to recognize that there are disabled customers out there who we are failing. Now, I appreciate that this is not necessarily the best points about getting leadership buy-in. It is difficult. Depending on the size of the organization you're in, you may be able to go straight to your CTO. You may have to go to your immediate manager. But ultimately, finding the arguments that fit best around what your product is, is the easiest and simplest way to go. Only really you know what the argument needs to be to get people in place on your team. So now that we've seen how to get your program off the ground, kind of at least, Let's have a little look at how your new Champions Network can function within these different organizations. We'll start with a small to medium-sized engineering team. On the screen, there's a roughly drawn circle with some much smaller circles inside. These represent the usual suspects, some designers, some developers, a manager or two. An organization of this size probably doesn't warrant a dedicated accessibility team, but could always, of course, benefit from a few people with particular knowledge. It doesn't take much to form a champions network here. In fact, one of the biggest benefits of a smaller organization, as I said, is often the ability to get things done without having to go through layers of management. Find other people who are of a similar mindset and start talking to each other. Encourage each other to speak up in meetings. On the screen, some of the smaller circles in the diagram have faded out, with the remaining circles colored blue and connected by lines to represent this small network. One of the most important things the Champions Network can do here is to, to develop that culture of thought and to think about accessibility from the first conversation to identify when knowledge and ability is missing. When that missing information is identified, say for doing an audit or to help with some testing, some ideas, you can always get a consultant in. On the screen, this is shown by a new circle outside of the main group. Bigger companies can really operate in much the same way. So here we're representing it in a similar fashion. There's another roughly drawn circle, just with a lot more smaller circles this time. When your network gets beyond a certain size though, you ideally want someone to be managing it. In this diagram, as last time, some of the circles are faded out, leaving those that represent the members of the network. In the middle is the larger circle, showing a hub for all of these individual champions to revolve around. Having that centralized hub, having someone coordinating, ensure the information isn't lost or conflicting. It helps productivity and encourages people to collaborate. And it makes everyone feel more comfortable with learning and developing. 
this coordinator doesn't have to be on an accessibility team. I'd argue that in fact, you may still not need a dedicated accessibility team at all. Of course, on that note, it's worth repeating, outside help is always available. As with last time, we're showing this with a circle outside of the main group. All of this being said, you might reach a certain threshold where it makes business sense to have an onboard accessibility team. At a larger company, where there are potentially multiple groups of developers working on their own different things, there might still effectively only be one product being made, but an internal accessibility team can help with make a lot of sense. These become your in-house specialists. So in this diagram, we have little networks inside of their own groups, all looking at one central accessibility team that also manages the different networks. They are there to provide, provide constant and consistent feedback to run in-house training, to develop and build the more complex accessibility solutions, both internally and externally. They can also serve as those network managers. In the diagram, the champions network isn't connected across divisions. Everything operates in a hub and spoke model with the accessibility team as the central point of contact. Ideally, we would like to see champions networks having some sort of regular meeting, whatever works for your organization. In a company of this size, it can be very difficult to organize those sorts of regular meetings for potentially hundreds of staff members. This is why it can be more effective for the networks within each division to operate independently. Of course, there is nothing to stop them communicating either directly with each other or via the management team. And as always, no matter how good your accessibility team might be, external consultants are always available. Finally, we get to the really big companies producing many different products. Orgs of this size will probably require multiple accessibility teams, each focused on their own product. But even here, a centralized network management team will allow for consistent sharing of information, training, and product output. In the diagram on the screen, we have three different boxes, each with their own circles inside, and each of those circles containing the smaller circles used to represent our different employees. Each of the boxes has an accessibility team connecting to all of the networks within their box. Outside of those boxes is one central uh, management team that is running and making sure that there is consistent information being shared across. So we see the champions network broken down by division, each reporting into a local accessibility team, which of course can always be supported by consultants. This might feel overwhelming. You might think, how did we get from nothing to this? You might be at a larger organization, one represented by this slide or the previous, and wondering how to get anywhere near this organized. It can seem a long way to get to this point. Of course, it's always worth remembering that it doesn't matter how big your organization is. You can always think local. Start with your team and the teams you interact with. Who do you know who already prioritizes accessibility? Who do you know who will speak up in meetings? Your network can start with just them. In fact, this works quite well when trying to persuade upper management of how good an idea this is. You don't need a cross-organizational network to be able to show the benefits of how it works. You can start in just your immediate vicinity. You can show that the teams that are being connected to this network are being more efficient and better output than the teams that aren't connected to the network. So in summary, you can always pay for expertise, but you cannot pay for culture. The Champions Network is where we establish that culture. So how can a Champions Network impact the culture of an entire organization? One of the most important parts of an inclusive engineering culture is asking questions. The foundational principles of accessibility can themselves be framed as such. Is what we're building perceivable? You might ask this by saying, are we building something that is invisible to all of someone's senses? Is what we're building operable? Are we building something that requires an interaction someone cannot perform? Is what we're building understandable? 
Are we building something that requires information someone will not or might not have? And finally, is what we're building robust? Are we building something that can only be accessed by a single technology? A champion's network should be rooted in these questions. Consider this your fundamental benchmark for membership. Any given champion can bring these questions to their team when product conversations first start. They can ask these questions through design and development. They can ensure these questions are answered when testing. With time, each of these questions and sub-questions can be broken down further by the multitude of needs that are encompassed within them. Let's focus on one question quickly to explore what I mean here. Are we building something that is invisible to all of someone's senses? So for example, if you're building an audio product, will captions be available for, the, for those unable to hear? Will transcripts be available for video products? Are you providing alt text for any images? Are you ensuring people aren't reliant on color to differentiate information? The more time your champions spend in the network, the more experience they get and the more comfortable they become, the more straightforward these questions will be to them, the more opportunities they will get to learn how to apply the questions that we're asking. People are complex. There are many combinations of access needs and therefore many questions to be asking. Each champion cannot be expected to, on their own, always know every question it needs asking or to always be able to spot a need that has not been surfaced. A big benefit of a network then is the collaboration. At each stage of the development or life cycle, documents can be shared across the network. That way, any question that hasn't been asked or need that hasn't been identified is more likely to be addressed by that second, third, maybe fourth champion reviewing the document. By introducing this basic set of questions to every step of the development process, and by sharing those questions out via a network of people who can each bring their own perspectives, we are normalizing these questions and thinking about the answers and therefore gradually changing the culture of thought within our organization. So what else can our Champions Network do? We talked a little bit about how we can instill confidence by asking questions and normalizing understanding. This all falls under the wider umbrella of training, both within the Champions Network and outside. Training on understanding access needs, training on product development, communication skills, even removing ableist language from documentation and dialogue. These trainings can be both in-person events or self-paced online learning, and are usually organized for the members of the network. They would then be in a position to take what they have learned back to their immediate teams. They could then facilitate their own small training sessions within their teams if it is warranted. If you have the time and the budget, bringing people in with different access needs to speak about their experiences, both with your products and technology in general, can be hugely informative and lead to a much greater understanding. Organizing this sort of event is something that a Champions Network is perfectly placed to do. It also serves as a great recruitment event. If you're coming from an organization that has none of this in place, no accessibility team, no champions network, you'll probably find that much of your organization and your products have been put together without any sort of accessibility in mind at all. That means that there will be a log of undoing of things in order to rebuild them, to incorporate that accessibility. Do not expect that putting a network in place will suddenly change those things. The process of undoing and rebuilding can be long, tiring, and frustrating. In my own role at Twitter, we have recently launched something that's taken a year to release. Not because it was a technical challenge or indeed a huge bureaucratic problem, but because we spent most of our first our time fixing systemic issues. Once those issues are fixed, <laughs> such as things are ever fixed, and once the culture starts to shift, these things will become easier and happen faster. So don't give up on that process. With that said, what makes a good champion? First, have a keen interest. Don't feel like you have to know or understand everything. As we've already discussed, it starts with asking questions, not with having answers. Training is a big part of this process. 
you will learn as you go. Second, have patience and fortitude. There will be bumps in the road, both in the work you do and in the work your colleagues do. Third, know how to ask for help. This whole process only works best when we collaborate and share information. If you don't feel confident speaking up, tag in a colleague who is better at that to work with you. You don't have to be all these things to everyone. Fourth, and this comes with a huge caveat, be ready to step up. Don't wait for the disabled expert to fix the disability issues. Don't assume that your disabled colleagues are experts at all. Of course, if you are the disabled person in the room, this can be difficult. You may feel exhausted from a lifetime of self-advocacy. Always be ready to sit something out and make sure you recognize when you need that. It can be a very difficult task being a disabled person in the accessibility space. Having some readiness to accept that not all problems can be solved on your own, whilst potentially difficult because often nobody else is listening, is a big step to self-healing, to uh, looking after yourself. Um, and these things are incredibly important. If you're not that disabled person in the room, make sure that you're aware of these things too. It can be tiring as a disabled person constantly on the lookout. Make sure that you're trying to get there first, not to be a voice for them, but to make sure that their voice is heard, to make sure that the space your disabled colleagues, your disabled customers need is available. And finally, what makes a good network manager? Again, you need patience. <laughs> you have to manage a lot of different things. You have to manage a lot of different people. There will always be the same road uh, bumps in the road and the same um, situations that you will have to come across. You don't necessarily have to be the expert in accessibility, but being in that position where you can make sure that everyone is learning is um, a, a hugely important position. Um, I know that there are many people probably in this room today who have done a lot more of that than I have. Um, I'm sure they'd be willing to talk about it. As I said at the start, um, this is a lot of opinion. This is a learning process for myself too. Um, and you should never be afraid to reach out to other people, people who've been there before you, people who've done these things too. Um, there is a whole wealth of information out there about how to run uh, champions networks um, and, and how to go about doing that in a way that might work for your environment. So just to recap, um, we have seen that all champions networks begin with the foundational principles. By simply introducing these four questions to your team, you will start to shift the culture of thought and encourage an accessibility mindset. We've also seen that there is no one way to run a champions network. Different organizations have different needs. A champions network can be flexible and can operate with or without a dedicated accessibility team. While it is hard, it is important to get that leadership buy-in. The system needs to work in both directions. Formalizing any document review process so those not in the network are required to engage with the network is the surest way to prevent glaring oversight. Finally, an effective champion network is filled with enthusiastic people who remember to ask for help, either through the network or via an outside consultant, and who prioritize collaboration above all else. We're a little short, um, but that is, uh, that is today. Thank you for listening. Great. Well, thank you so much for that. With that, we can dive straight into the Q&A. We have had some great questions pouring in to participants. I encourage you to continue taking advantage of the Q&A section. Add your questions in there. So the first question that came up is, what is the form that an accessibility hub might take? For example, would you use something like a Slack channel? How do you maintain momentum for something like this? Uh, those are really good questions. Um, so depending on the size of your organization, it can be as simple um, as having a piece of paper where you write down people's names. Um, it doesn't have to be super formal, um, making sure you keep track of, of who in your organization um, is putting in that time, who needs that support. Um, that is the most important thing for me. 
Um, obviously, the, the bigger your network gets, the more organized that needs to be. Um, and so, yes, like things like Slack can be a really good place to have those conversations, um, trying to make sure that you not necessarily in person, but um, sort of live meetings um, where people can come together. It can feel quite lonely sometimes. So making sure that you put that time in um, to making sure that um, people have access to each other in a more formal setting. Um, so they're not reliant on bumping into each other, which particularly right now in the environment of homeworking can be even harder. Um, I don't know if that really answered the question. Um, I'm sure there are there are people with much more experience of managing networks than I am who can probably give better examples of, of how they go about their day to day. But a very ex important point of building community there in whatever format that looks like within your organization. Yeah, I mean, so community community building is definitely a, a huge part of that, and that will that will vary depending on what your organization looks like. Um, you know, it might be a case of just bringing a box of donuts to a meeting room once a week. Uh, it might be a case of uh, you know trying to wrangle people across multiple time zones. Um, so yeah, but community is is a huge part of um, getting that network in place. Good point. All right, another question. Do you find that people with a basic understanding of accessibility end up making new errors due to assumptions about how accessibility might work? Um, it can definitely be a problem. I'm not going to pretend that, you know, with this network in place, suddenly everybody becomes, uh, you know, and gets all the knowledge they need. Um, you do need to watch out for... Uh, misplaced advice I'll, I'll put it diplomatically um there, there are definitely people who are trying to do the right thing um who might just sort of offer up the wrong solution um having buddy systems for things like this can be really helpful um if you have somebody who's a bit more experienced in the network um you know they can work with newer members or younger members um just to sort of be able to pass on that advice so that you know that the newer member can can take on the bulk of the work, but has somebody they know they can go to for questions. Um, because yes, like it, it can be a huge problem. You don't want to you don't want to treat the network members as experts, uh, take their feedback for what it is, and then suddenly find that the feedback they've been giving um, is actually detrimental to the product. Um, so in a, in a small space, um, that can be harder. I don't want to sound like you shouldn't try. Um, getting anything in place is better than having nothing. Um, it's certainly the kind of environment where you just sort of have to trust yourself a little bit and go with it. Um, you know, any any input ultimately is generally better than none. Um, and a lot of these things you can learn. <laughs> um, and as I, I said a few times, if you're not sure, then you know you can either turn to paid consultancy. You can get people to come in and provide you with answers. Or you can look outside of your company. Um, there are networks for networks. Um, there are, you know, groups on the internet that will happily have conversations about what accessibility means, how you can apply it to your product space, um, just the general practices. Um, there are Slack groups for that. Um, so there are all sorts of resources available um, if you're not sure. Um, you know, if you don't feel comfortable and you're in a small environment and you only feel like there's only a couple of people around then absolutely start looking outside of your company for those, uh, those resources that help. Um, yeah, but the bigger you get and the more experienced people get, um, the more time you can ask people, the more time you can, you can have two sets of eyes looking at a document. You can make sure, as I said, that you've got those buddies in place um, to be able to help out and make sure that people are giving positive advice and not um, detrimental. That's a great point. And we got a follow-up question there. So you mentioned seeking out resources that there are many available on the web, for example. Do you have any recommendations of what some of those references or resources might be? Um, <laughs> I mean, Twitter is a good place to start. There are, there are lots of people on there. Um, there is um, notionally a web accessibility Slack group um, that is, it kind of extends beyond web at this point. Um, and it is a, an amazing resource for getting, having conversations. Um, so that's a good place to start. Um, there is a network um, for um, champions networks. I can share the information on Twitter after, the, after this talk, um, which 
people you know if, if you're looking to get a network set up if you're helping to hoping to get information on how to improve the network you've already got um then that's a, an excellent group of people um, who come together from um some a whole range of different companies you know some with very established champions networks some who are just getting off the ground um so in all sorts of different positions um yeah i will share that information on twitter um after this chat and for those who want to find you on Twitter, what's your handle? Uh, my handle is at A R Hayward, H A Y W A R D. Uh, don't feel compelled to follow me. Uh, it's mostly just nonsense. <laughs> but sounds like there will be some resources to follow up from today's session, which is great. Yes, yeah, I, I will. I will be sharing those. Um, next question. So how do you go about getting the efforts of champions recognized by the business and made part of the performance review cycle? Um, so at Twitter, for example, um, part of our um, review cycle involves um, things that we would consider good for Twitter. Um, so that can just mean sort of helping out in ways that aren't necessarily part of your day-to-day um, -day time. Um, we also make sure that um, because our network is officially recognized, um, there is an expectation in place that managers will allow network members to give sort of 10% time um, to network activity. Um, so both of those things, um, you know, we do, we do look at um, and it is written up into um, review packages um, and you know, annual feedback, that kind of thing. Um, one of the things we're working on at the moment is to offer additional training to allow people to sort of progress. Um, so they're not just sort of sitting there being um, a sort of a voice in the crowd, but that they can take training in sort of the specialism they want, whether that's additional web or Android or iOS training, uh, you know, further design courses, um, and the intent is to recognize them um, with sort of levels within the network. Um, you know, this is early days for that. Um, and this is all sort of part of the conversation that's ongoing. Um, so there are definitely ways of doing it. Um, you know, obviously, depending on what you do, you can, um, you know, as a network manager, potentially, you can reach out to their manager and inform the management team of you know, things that have been done well. Um, you know, make sure that that is on their list. I know often when it comes to, to feedback, um, a lot of work that is done by accessibility champions sort of goes unnoticed because they're doing things um, that aren't necessarily formal or official. So just making sure that, um, you know, sort of management teams are aware of the work that your colleagues are doing. If you see someone putting in that bit of extra effort, um, you know, inform their manager or inform them, you know, say that, you know, I appreciate the work you're putting in. Um, sometimes, you know, the best feed feedback is the stuff that just comes immediately from someone you're working with. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be official, but just getting recognized for the work you're doing. Um, you know, it can be hard sort of doing a lot of this work and feeling like you're doing it in silence. So having your colleagues just know they appreciate the extra effort that you're doing, um, you know, if you're in an informal network, for example, um, then that can be a, a really good motivator to, uh, to get people to carry on doing that work because it is important. Um, and as I said, it, it often goes unnoticed by sort of wider um, engineering teams. So That's a great point. And we've got some follow up questions here. So in thinking about how to frame the efforts of a champions network, how do you measure the impact of this effort? <laughs> That's a really, really good question. Um, depending on, on the size of the engineering organization, um, it can be much harder to spot. Um, you know, if you've got a small team and you can show that by uh, you know, catching these, these problems early, um, by looking at systems and saying, okay, like, you know, often uh, did, engineering teams will, will get an accessibility problem and they will, they'll file it away in, in JIRA or wherever it is they, they use. Um, and they'll say, okay, that's going on our accessibility backlog. And these things build up and they often, either they don't get done and they just sort of sit there filling up space or they become this sort of weight around the team's neck where they, they think, oh, we've we got to go fix that. Um, so a lot of that stuff can just slow down 
development practice, even at a most basic level. If you have to push past tickets to see the ones you're working on, then that is even just a 10 second overhead that adds up. Um, but you know, the sort of the practical implications of, of having to go back and, and fix things that didn't need to be fixed in the first place. Um, you know, a lot of problems come about because you have to rebuild things entirely. Um, if, if the conversations happen at the beginning, if you can show that the product that you built last time, you had to go back and, and, and destructure half of it in order to get the accessibility things in place. And the next product you're building, you took that learning in from the beginning and you didn't have to do that. The development time can be hugely reduced. Um, and <laughs> I hate to go to the, the financial argument, but often, you know, if you, if you tell up a management that by doing these things, it'll save us, you know, 10 engineering hours a day across this whole team, um, that can add up to quite a lot of money. Um, so that, that can often be a, a good motivator. Um, you know, if, if the idea of, of not getting more customers um, isn't enough, then, then telling them that they can cut costs on their, on their internal engineering is a good way to go too. Um, I've kind of forgotten what the question was now, but I hope it answers it. I think that is great. It was questioning regarding how do you measure the impact? And I think you named a few really great practices there. To shift gears slightly, there's been some questions about the balance between internal expertise and external expertise. So can you speak a little bit to the balance when you are seeking external consultation? How do you balance that with sometimes internal folks know the situation the best? So how do you strike that balance between internal expertise and external support? Uh, yeah, another really good question. Um, I think, yeah, it, a lot of it is, is a difficult one because you need to sort of gauge not just how well you know the situation, but how, how confident you feel in dealing with it. Um, and ideally, you'd be able to have the same sort of consultancy team um, on board all the time. You'd be able to sort of have some sort of retainer in place or whatever it is. Um, whether that's an official arrangement with an actual practicing company or whether it's just knowing um, that the same freelancers that you used the last time are available for this one. Um, you know, it can be beneficial to your point to have people who are available, who, who know the problems and the systems that you're working with um, so that they can come in and help with that. Um, obviously, if that's not the case, then it takes a bit more time um, to to get that relationship in place, to, to enable that understanding. Um, but a lot of the problems ultimately sort of boil down to the same sorts of situations. Um, it's generally not really worth worrying too much about whether the, the consultancy team is gonna come in and, and fully understand. If you can boil down the problems that you're seeing and remove the sort of specifics of the situation, if you're able to to ask the questions that we looked at, those fundamental questions, um, and see, uh, are we actually doing this? Are, are we building a product that isn't perceivable or isn't robust? And be able to, to ask yourself those questions. And you might not have the, the answers as to what to do about it, but if you can take those questions to the external consultants and say, these are the problems we're dealing with from a fundamental level, um, you know, they can come back and provide solutions to the, the answers you're, you're asking. Um, and you can then start applying them to the, you know, the specific situations that you might have a better handle on. Because um, it, it really does boil down to sort of the same sorts of problems a lot of times. Um, you know, I think often we feel like we're dealing with unique issues. But once you start asking outside of your company, once you start asking you know, on, on the wider internet, um, has anyone seen this problem, then you know, it, the specifics might not be um, available or relevant to everyone, but if you break them down into the particular problems, then a lot of them have been solved before. Um, and it, it's a case of working out how to take that learning from, from someone else's work um, and apply it to your specific situation. That's a great point. And in thinking about the internal side of that and hiring for a central ally team, what is your take on the importance of having ally certifications on that team? And 
how do you balance the need to have someone technical with someone who perhaps can be that culture builder? <laughs> um, I have my opinions on certification. Um, <clears throat> I think, I'll try and be diplomatic. Um, I think they, they can be useful, um, but don't rely on people necessarily um, having them. I think a lot of people in the industry um, don't have those certifications, don't have those qualifications because they've been doing this um, in an environment that was never really suitable for it. Um, the sort of modern accessibility movement is actually sort of relatively young from a large corporate point of view. Um, there have been people sort of practicing in the industry for a very long time that have never needed those qualifications, that have never um, had to you know, get them in place. That is not to say that you shouldn't go out and get them. Um, I think you know, if you're starting out in the industry, um, then it can be a useful thing to show that you've put that work in. Um, but ultimately, they are not the sort of the be all and end all of what it means to be qualified. Um, and ultimately, it is an exam um, and it requires learning some things. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to take a solid stand either way. Um, I'll let people decide on their own whether they think it's, it's worth their time or not. Um, so I think just to take a step back from that, it can be very difficult for a company that doesn't have anything in place who decides they want to build that accessibility team um, to, to start something. How do you know that the people you're getting in are actually able to do the job if you have nobody on the inside who's able to tell you otherwise. Um, I think a lot of these things, you know, you can go back to your consultants. Again, um, you can ask them what sorts of questions you should be asking. Um, you could ask them what sorts of people you should be looking for. Um, ultimately, it is a really difficult question. Um, I think, you know, sometimes maybe we, we are too much on, on name recognition um, when we shouldn't, but that is unfortunately one of the best ways to do a lot of this stuff these days. Um, you know, the community will recognize people in, in that space. Um, you know, if you go looking for them, they are there. Um, and as I said, the, the corporate aspect of accessibility teams is now moving. Um, you know, more and more people are coming through with that experience. You know, we're looking at a whole new generation now of people who are coming in with that interest and wanting to have a job in accessibility, um, whereas most people who have been in that industry for a long time have come at it from other areas, whether that's sort of design with an accessibility interest or engineering with an accessibility interest or project management with an accessibility interest. You know, we're now getting people who are specializing in accessibility from, from the get-go. Um, so it's a very long hand wavy way of saying um, it's hard, <laughs> um, but you know, just, just ask questions, um, try and get people who you know, the industry does recognize whether that's as a paid consultancy or just asking, you know, sort of friends on the internet, um, what sorts of things should we be looking for? Um, the other side of that question, I think, was about getting people, you know, that, that mixture of, of different personalities in the company. Um, it's difficult. Um, you know, as I said, they don't necessarily have to be the same person. Um, the network manager, for example, doesn't have to be um, strongly um, in, in the accessibility space. It helps if they know what they're doing, um, but they don't have to be, you know, someone with 15 years of dedicated engineering experience or design experience. Um, you know, they have to have that interest and that desire to push people to help them learn. Um, so, I mean, ultimately, you might find people with the same sorts of things. Generally, people in the accessibility space tend to be quite outspoken in their area anyway. Um, you know, they, they enjoy that kind of thing. Um, so, usually, because of the the lack of pickup in, in the past, people who are in that space are more than willing to go out and advocate at the same time. Um, so generally, you might often find one inside the other anyway. With that, we are at time. Um, Andrew, thank you so much for the fabulous conversation and lots of takeaways for those trying to start accessibility movements in their organization. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for listening.